Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today we're going to talk about free will. Uh, in particular, uh, I want to talk about some uh, some developments in uh, in the concept of free will uh, and its counterpart of uh, divine sovereignty, uh, which we've discussed before in other lectures, uh, and the developments of this doctrine throughout the medieval period, throughout the uh, the scholastics, uh, and then also a principle which develops uh, late in the medieval period with Duns Scotus, uh, which. Uh, which my advisor, uh, professor of mine, uh, Dr. Thomas Williams, has referred to as the stomach principle. Uh, I'll explain what exactly this means um, near the uh, in the sort of last part of the video. Uh, but first, uh, before we get to this distinction, before we get to this this principle or this rule, I first want to go through uh, and talk about how the idea of free will changed throughout the scholastic period, beginning with Augustine and then developing through all the way to Scotus, who is who I want to ultimately talk about here. Uh, so Augustine has, uh, in maybe in the modern day, uh, post-Reformation day at least, uh, a reputation for being somewhat of a, uh, a determinist, almost a proto-Calvinist. Um, however, this varies uh, quite a lot throughout the history of his writing. Uh, Augustine had a very long writing career, and his early views were very different from his later views. Uh, and so different people were influenced by different parts of what Augustine wrote. Um, the scholastic tradition was, uh, as I would argue at least, um, influenced more so by his earlier works, which emphasized uh, freedom more so than divine providence. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for this. A lot of it had to do with who he was arguing with at the time. Um, a lot of it just had to do with development of thought. Uh, but in terms of the intellectual tradition, we first see uh, freedom of choice, or freedom of the will, or free will, or however you wind up wanting to call it. Uh, we find it articulated in, uh, in some of Augustine's early writings. Um, in particular, uh, he refers to what we will wind up calling free will, in sort of the modern period, um, as the free choice, or free choice of the will. Why this terminology is significant is because we can trace through uh, the scholastic period how the terminology changes and how the corresponding ideas change. Augustine, at this early point in, in scholastic philosophy, uh, didn't consider uh, the will as a separate faculty from the intellect. Right? So the intellect is what cognizes things and what perceives things, and uh, importantly perceives things as desirable, as a, an object of willing. Um, the will is intellectual appetite. This is standard terminology that, can, that gets carried through through the medieval period, uh, all the way through to, uh, to Aquinas. Uh, but what this means can subtly change between different thinkers. Um, when we begin with Augustine, the will is simply appetite. It is simply what the intellect perceives to be or, or uh, it, it cognizes as worthy of pursuit, worth pursuing. Uh, and so um, Augustine is more or less what we might call an intellectualist. The intellect is what does the deciding rather than a separate, uh, a separate faculty uh, or a separate um, power called the will. Uh, and so the freedom of the will, uh, the freedom of choice, or the free choice, sorry, not freedom of choice, free choice of the will uh, for Augustine means that the uh, the will is not itself free to choose. We have free choice. But that is a faculty of the intellect. Right? The intellect, which is the, the power to, to, uh, to discern between opposites, to go back to Aristotle in particular, um, our, our ability to cognize things and to cognize them under certain categorizations, including the relevant sense, which is um, uh, under the description of good worth pursuing, the intellect is what does the deciding. That is what makes the, this free choice. So this is the early stage of the, of the scholastic development of, of ideas concerning free will or free choice. Moving forward a bit, we get to St. Anselm. Uh, I've had uh, quite a lecture on Anselm's uh, doctrine of free will, uh, or what we might in the modern period call free will. Um, Anselm refers to this pretty consistently as freedom of choice. Right. Uh, so we've moved from talking about the choice itself and saying that the choice is free to focusing on what that freedom in particular means once we get to Anselm. So Anselm talks about freedom of choice. What is this freedom that we are talking about? 
Uh, rather than focusing on the mechanics of choice, like Augustine does, because he's more concerned with the intellect, Anselm takes the choice as, as the action of an agent, right, of a moral agent. Uh, and in most of his relevant writings, is less particularly concerned uh, with the intellect's role in freedom of choice and is more concerned with our various inclinations and how we choose uh, to act on those inclinations and how we choose between those various inclinations. Uh, more on this one, I, I've explained this in much, much more depth on my, um, my series of, of uh, lectures on Anselm's on freedom of choice. Um, so if you're interested in Anselm's perspective there in particular, uh, check those out. They will be linked below. Um, so they are quite long, but it is, uh, in my mind, worth, uh, worth looking into. So as we move forward from freedom of choice, considering the freedom as the object of study, we eventually, once we get to uh, Aquinas, and then ultimately, especially to Scotus, uh, Duns Scotus following up, uh, John Duns Scotus shortly after Aquinas, um, we then come to actually talk about free will or freedom of the will. The will being free, the will as the actual faculty under consideration, uh, and what it's freedom means, or what its freedom entails, or how it is free, or what it is free to do, and its relationship to the intellect. Uh, now, Aquinas had uh, a roughly intellectualist uh, idea of freedom, of uh, the will's freedom, of free will, um, which I will probably discuss uh, at another time. Uh, that I, won't, I don't want that to really be the focus of this video, but by that point uh, in, in medieval history, uh, philosophers were talking about the will as being free and what that means. Once we finally get to Duns Scotus, near the end of the scholastic period, uh, the sort of end, the, the the beginning of the transition from from medieval to modern, if you will, um, you actually have the discussion of the will as being its own faculty, separate from the intellect, as these being two different powers that we have. Right, we can. We can think about stuff, and we can choose stuff. And those aren't the same action, those aren't the same part of us doing the action. Right? So for Scotus, we think about things. Right? We cognize them. We even cognize them as worth desiring, worth pursuing, as you know, understand them as good. The intellect can have its appetites. But will is this separate faculty uh, which does the choosing between what is presented to it by the intellect. So this is the the sort of uh, the sort of end point of this discussion in terms of scholastic philosophy of freedom of the will. So we have this move from free choice of the will, as Augustine explains it, where the uh, the actual object under consideration is just the choice; it's the action, uh, and so it, it is purely in the realm of action theory of uh, of what the um, what is desired and how we act upon that desire. We move forward uh, through Anselm uh, and other contemporaries, uh, where we start talking about freedom of choice, where we start talking about, well, what is this freedom, not just the choice, not just the desire or the, the, the will in the Augustinian sense, it's just this, this appetite, this desire, right? We're really talking about what is it to be free. Then eventually, near the end of the scholastic period, uh, in the debates between Aquinas representing the Dominican tradition and uh, Scotus uh, representing the uh, Franciscan tradition, uh, that's when we actually start talking about the will itself and what it means for the will, this independent faculty, to be free. Okay, with all that in mind, uh, I want to look at a distinction that is made throughout this period, uh, especially by Anselm and by Scotus, they make the distinction in slightly different ways and using slightly different terms, uh, but I think it is ultimately roughly the same distinction. Uh, and this is uh, what, uh, what uh, Dr. Williams refers to as the stomach principle. Uh, and he gets this from an analogy from Duns Scotus. Uh, and essentially, um, uh, Scotus points out in, in more complicated terms than this, that there are two kinds of things. There are two sorts of things in creation. There are stomachs, or things like stomachs, and there are wills, or perhaps things like wills. Um, but it's also worth noting that wills are the only things 
uh, in creation that are quite like wills. Uh, so what is this distinction? Well, uh, if we look at how our faculty of digestion works, right, how is it that we digest food? Our stomach always works as uh, to the greatest extent that it is capable of working. Right? Uh, when you eat food, you do not choose whether or not to digest it. You simply do. Your body digests it for you. That's just how it works. It just does its thing. Uh, by contrast, when you choose, when, you, when your will chooses to pick something up and put it into your mouth, you can either choose to do that or to not do that, or to do it less so. You can choose to put, take a smaller bite, take a larger bite. You can choose to eat something else. You can choose between opposites. You can choose not at all. You can choose to fast. Right. This is the key distinction. Um, Scotus refers to this as uh, as rational powers, like the will, uh, which have the uh, have the ability to discern between or choose between opposites, uh, and natural powers, uh, like the stomach or like digestion, uh, which always operate to their fullest extent as dictated by their nature. Hence, natural. Um, Anselm uses slightly different terms for a very, for a very similar distinction. Um, Anselm, because he is, again, he's talking about uh, what does it mean for choice to be free, he's talking about freedom here, um, and he's talking about it in the context of choice, not so much in the context of a, of a faculty per se. He's more concerned about kinds of actions uh, rather than kinds of things. So when Anselm makes a similar distinction, uh, he uses uh, slightly different terms. He refers to the, the sort of free thing, the will sort of thing, um, those actions as being spontaneous. Uh, and he contrasts spontaneous action or spontaneous events with either, uh, he'll either refer to it as natural, same as Scotus, or necessary. Uh, so I will, um, I'm going to read here from the, the glossary here from, uh, this is from Anselm's On Freedom of Choice. Um, so spontaneous here uh, is defined as such. In this technical sense, an act is spontaneous or an agent acts spontaneously when the act can be fully explained only by reference to something that originates from within the agent. So what this means is a spontaneous choice or spontaneous action. Um, does not have an antecedent determining cause. And that is the key, uh, both for Anselm and for Scotus. By contrast, if we are talking about um, choice merely in terms of intellectual appetite, right? the will is the intellectual appetite, right? the intellect determines um, that something is more worth pursuing than something else. Right. I, I choose coffee rather than tea, right? What that means for uh, something like an intellectualist, someone more like Augustine, uh, even more like Aquinas, but that's also slightly... Aquinas has a more nuanced position, as he always does. We can stick with Augustine. And what this would mean is that uh, my intellect, right, my, my, um, my rational capacity has determined that uh, coffee would satisfy me more than tea for such and such reasons. And so what the will is in that sense, in that context, is just my act of pursuing that choice rather than another. Right? I could have, in principle, uh, decided, right? used my intellect to determine the other way. But that seems to be in, in some part determined by the object of choice, right? Uh, and it's maybe it's relationship to me. Right? If if coffee is mm, how do I put this? I want to put this very carefully. Um, if my preferences align more closely to coffee, let's say coffee is the kind of thing that aligns with my subjective preferences. Um, what that means is that the qualities of the coffee, as distinct from the qualities of the tea. Uh, are simply appealing to my intellect, to my my in this case my very low level intellect, my uh, my sensitive uh, my sensitive appetites, um, in such a way that my intellect will choose them rather than tea, right? 
Now, in another circumstance that might be different, and the circumstances may have some input and some control over what choice I make, but the important part to emphasize here is that on this, uh, on this sort of a reading, that this choice is not, to use Anselm's terms, spontaneous, because it's determined by the situation, by the object of the choice, and by rational considerations. Now, these rational considerations, excuse me, are internal to me, they're internal to the agent. However, they are considering things which are outside the agent in such a way that I could not choose otherwise in a given very particular situation. The details of the situation on this model uh, determine what choice is to be made. And what this means for Anselm, if this is correct, Anselm thinks that this means that our choices are not spontaneous. In other words, that our choices are not free. So this can't be the case. Our choices have to originally originate fully from within ourselves. We make uh, our choices without be them being determined by the object of the situation or the any other external factors. Now, as we move on through scholastic history to get towards Scotus, uh, Scotus develops this further and points out that the will is the, the, the power within us or the faculty within us that allows us to make this kind of a choice right? and allows us to act spontaneously. And this is where the terminology uh, begins to change because uh, he doesn't refer to the will as a spontaneous power. Right? He wants to uh, contextualize uh, his terminology within the discussion of the time, and the discussion of the time mostly involves Aristotle. Uh, and Aristotle made the distinction between rational and natural powers. Rational powers being those which are capable of determining between opposites. or They are concerning opposites. They can discern between or determine between opposites. Uh, this is why uh, Aristotle thought that the intellect was the rational power. Because the intellect can consider true and false and determine between them. Right? The intellect can, can consider good and bad and determine between them, choosing the good. Right? But as we move forward, we start to get this, uh, we, we start to get this, uh, this idea that I've just been discussing, that if the intellect is considering outside factors, then it is, right, which determine its decision, then the intellect per se according to Scotus, is not a rational power. So for Scotus, the intellect is not rational. The will is rational. Now he puts a lot of nuance on this, and he does explain what he means by this, right? And he, he doesn't mean to say that the intellect acts irrationally in the ordinary sense of the term, right? And he doesn't even mean to say that the intellect does not determine between opposites. But its fundamental, uh, its fundamental inclination is towards one object, which is truth, right? Its fundamental inclination is not towards uh, different or contradictory op uh, uh, objects, right? Uh, it's not like the intellect has to choose between mutually contradictory truths. That would be self-contradictory. By contrast, the will does need to choose between mutually exclusive goods. Because the will's object is the good, right? Uh, that goes all the way back to, to at least Augustine, uh, at least within this tradition. The problem then becomes, though, what happens when you have to choose between two competing goods? This is a thing which can occur, at least in the in sort of the fallen world that we inhabit. If this is the case, and we do have to choose between competing goods, Scotus points out that this means that the will is the rational faculty that we possess, because it really does need to discern between and choose between opposites. And so the will is what allows us, uh, rational, free agents, um, to make free choices between uh, different options. Not merely reducing that to a matter of intellectually uh, discovering or cognizing which is the better option and automatically going with that. So to bring this back to the stomach principle, the will is a rational power. 
uh, SCOTUS argues that it is THE rational power. Because it is the only power which discerns and chooses between opposites without being determined by, uh, by something outside of the agent. Even the intellect, according to Scotus, is a natural power, like a stomach. Right? When presented with truth, the intellect cognizes it. It's not like when you find out something true... He uses this analogy in a couple of places, right? It's not like that when you find out something true, the intellect can either choose to choose to understand it or not to understand it. If the intellect is capable of understanding it, it's going to understand it completely, fully, as best as it's capable of doing. The intellect does not have the does not have the choice to understand a concept presented before it or not. The will is what then decides to either present concepts before the intellect and or um, how to act upon what the intellect discovers or what the intellect uh, determines. So this is a, this is a, um, a major distinction between, uh, between well, our powers as rational agents. Uh, and this is also a different way of looking at the relationship between um, between reason and will, or intellect and will, if you want. Uh, then also the uh, the a way of of separating out this uh, of of pulling apart this distinction we have between uh, determined and free, that our actions are only free if they are free in this sense, if they are spontaneous, right? If they're act if the actions are not uh, in any way determined from something outside of us. Now this does bring up issues. Right? This brings up problems and questions. Um, foremost being, well, what determines how we make the choice? Right? Um, Anselm answers this sort of a question by pointing out, well, the the agent determines what makes the choice, and that's all there is to it. Right? To ask what determines how we make the choice is to uh, is, in es is essentially to beg the question. Right? We're asking the wrong sort of question in that case. Right? Nothing determines how we make the choice. We determine how we make the choice, and that's all there is to it. To ask the question in that way is to already assume that our choices are not spontaneous. They are not free in that sense. Right. So hopefully this distinction is uh, has been made somewhat clear. Um, because this is a uh, this is part of uh, uh, part of this long development of the modern concept of free will, uh, because when we talk about free will and determinism in uh, in sort of contemporary discussions, um, we sometimes don't quite realize that this concept has a history, um, and so if we look at different ways that it has been conceived, we often will try to say, well, where is the concept of free will in Aristotle, for example, well, you won't exactly find it in Aristotle, uh, or even in Augustine, or even really for that matter in Anselm, uh, but you'll find something analogous to it, and you'll find something that is developing towards um, a full, uh, detailed notion of what we understand to be free will. So hopefully this has been a useful uh, historical analysis and also a useful conceptual analysis, and hopefully we've learned a new interesting term here. Uh, so with that, uh, I will see everybody next time. Bye.